The nation had only digested and come to terms with the horrific events at Ruby Ridge, Idaho, and the events at Waco, Texas, when the news broke about the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, on April 19, 1995, which was the second anniversary of the fiery end to the Waco siege. What led to the Oklahoma City bombing? Who was responsible? What was the result of this event? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, a veteran of the United States Army and Marine Corps, former history professor, book author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. The primary culprits were Timothy McVeigh, Michael Fortier, and Terry Nichols. They all met at Fort Benning, Georgia in 1988 and became friends. Both McVeigh and Nichols were radicalized by white supremacist and anti-government propaganda and were angry at the federal government's handling of the 1992 standoff with Randy Weaver and his family at Ruby Ridge, as well as the 51-day Waco siege the following year. In fact, McVeigh visited the Waco site during the standoff in March 1993 and again after the siege was over. These events prompted him to plan on bombing a federal building in response. McVeigh believed that federal agents were no better than communists or Nazis and believed that any of their locations were legitimate targets, although he had considered assassinating several people, including Attorney General Janet Reno, FBI sniper Lon Horiyuchi, famed at Ruby Ridge and Waco, and former Attorney General Bill Barr, among others. McVeigh decided to have a mass casualty event. The more dead bodies, the greater the message. McVeigh and Nichols decided that the chosen target should house at least two of the three federal law enforcement agencies involved in Ruby Ridge and Waco. Those agencies were the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Drug Enforcement Administration, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. In his own words, he, quote, regarded the presence of additional law enforcement agencies, such as the Secret Service or the U.S. Marshal Service, as a bonus. During December 1994, McVeigh and Fortier drove to Oklahoma City to inspect their primary target, the nine-story Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, named for a federal judge, which contained 14 federal agencies such as DEA, ATF, Social Security Administration and recruiting offices for the Army and Marine Corps, and an employee's daycare center with small children and even infants. However, they had previously considered many targets in other locations in Missouri, Arizona, Texas, and Arkansas. But McVeigh chose the Murrah Building because he expected its glass front to shatter under the impact of the blast. According to McVeigh's own statements, he believed that the adjacent large open parking lot across the street might absorb and dissipate some of the force and protect the occupants of nearby non-federal buildings. He also thought that the open space around the building would provide better photo opportunities for propaganda purposes. In his own statement again, he planned the attack for April 19, 1995 to coincide with not only the second anniversary of the Waco siege, but also the Battle of Lexington and Concord. McVeigh and Nichols placed materials for the bomb in rented sheds. McVeigh obtained nine binary explosive kinesticks from a gun collector named Roger E. Moore in August 1994. They then robbed Moore's home of $60,000 worth of guns, gold, silver, and jewels and transported the property in Moore's stolen van. Ironically, in the belief that his involvement would not be suspected, McVeigh wrote a letter to Moore claiming that government agents had burglarized him. Those stolen items from Moore were later found in Terry Nichols' home and in a storage shed that he had rented. McVeigh tested the early explosive with Nichols outside of Nichols' home in Harrington, Kansas. Satisfied that they were not totally incompetent, on September 30, 1994, Nichols bought 40 50-pound bags of ammonium nitrate fertilizer from Mid-Kansas Co-op in McPherson, Kansas. Nichols later bought an additional 50-pound bag on October 18, 1994. 
McVeigh stated that he originally intended to use hydrazine rocket fuel, but it was far too expensive. In October 1994, McVeigh paid Michael and Lori Fortier a visit and showed them a diagram he had drawn of the bomb that he wanted to build, containing about 5,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate fertilizer mixed with 1,200 pounds of liquid nitromethane used in drag races and 350 pounds of Tobex packed in 1655 U.S. gallon drums. The bomb would have a combined weight of right around 7,000 pounds. McVeigh tried to buy the liquid fuel mixtures from several sources, and most of the vendors refused because of McVeigh's conflicting reasons for why he wanted the fuels. All except VP Racing Fuels representative Tim Chambers, who sold McVeigh three barrels. In McVeigh's rented storage unit, he stockpiled seven crates of 18-inch long Tobex, 80 spools of shock tube, and 500 electric blasting caps stolen from the Martin Marietta Aggregates Quarry in Marion, Kansas. He decided not to steal any of the 40,000 pounds of ANFO that was there because he did not believe it was powerful enough for his purposes, although he did eventually obtain 17 bags of ANFO from another source. McVeigh and Nichols set off another test bomb in the desert to avoid detection. On October 14, 1995, McVeigh paid for a room at the Dreamland Motel in Junction City, Kansas, and the next day, he rented a 1993 Ford F700 Ryder truck under the name of Robert D. Kling. He used that alias because it belonged to an army soldier he had served with named Kling and with whom he had shared physical characteristics. McVeigh, who had previously used aliases, had absent-mindedly signed in under his real name at the motel and used the address also on his forged license, which was also recorded later on the charge seat at the Perry Police Station after his arrest. On April 16, 1995, McVeigh drove to Alabama City in a yellow 1977 Mercury Marquis, while Nichols drove his blue 1984 GMC pickup truck. They parked the Marquis a few blocks from the Murrah Federal Building and removed the car's license plate. McVeigh then left a note on the dashboard covering the vehicle's identification plate number, the VIN, with a note that said, quote, not abandoned, pleased do not tow, will move by April 23, needs battery and cable. Luckily for investigators, the nearby Regency Towers apartment building, lobby security camera, recorded images of the blue truck as both men took off in the truck and then returned to Kansas. During April 17th and 18th, 1995, McVeigh and Nichols loaded the bomb into the rental truck and then drove to Geary Lake State Park. Then they nailed wooden boards onto the floor of the truck to hold the weight of the 13 barrels. Each barrel weighed nearly 500 pounds, and McVeigh packed even more explosives to the driver's side of the cargo bay, which he could set off. His backup plan, should all else fail, was to kill himself with his Glock 21 pistol in case the primary fuses failed, in fact. During McVeigh's trial, Lori Fortier testified that McVeigh claimed to have arranged the barrels in order to form a shape charge by tamping the aluminum side panel of the truck with bags of ammonium nitrate fertilizer to direct the blast laterally towards the building. McVeigh admitted that the barrels were placed in the shape of a backwards J for pure destructive power and that he would have put the barrels on the side of the cargo bay closest to the Murrah building. However, such an unevenly distributed load might have broken an axle, flipped the truck over, or at least caused it to lean to one side, which would have drawn attention. All or most of the barrels contained metal cylinders of acetylene intended to increase the fireball and the brilliance of the explosion. McVeigh drilled two holes in the cab of the truck under the seat, while two holes were also drilled into the body of the truck, where he added a fuel fuse ignition system, which was accessible from the front cab. One green cannon fuse was run through each hole into the cab as a time-delayed fuse run through plastic fish tank tubing conduit connected to two sets of non-electric blasting caps. These were to ignite the 350 pounds of Tobex Blastrite, a high-grade explosive, setting off the primary explosion, which would then set off the rest of the barrels. He painted the tubing yellow to blend in to the truck and duct taped them to the wall to make it harder to disable by pulling from the outside. All of the extra materials and tools were left in the truck to be destroyed. After finishing their work, Nichols returned home to Harrington and McVeigh drove to 
Junction City with the truck. McVeigh's admitted that his original plan had been to detonate the bomb at 11 a.m., but at dawn on April 19, 1995, he decided to destroy the building at 0900 or 9 a.m. McVeigh drove into Oklahoma City at 8.50 a.m., and at 8.57, the Regency Towers apartment security camera that had previously recorded Nichols' pickup truck recorded the Ryder truck heading towards the Murrah building. It was at that time that McVeigh lit the five-minute delayed action fuse. Three minutes later, he lit the two-minute fuse and parked the Ryder truck in a drop-off zone situated under the daycare center. Then he left and docked the truck. As he headed to get his getaway vehicle, he admitted that he had dropped the keys to the truck a few blocks away. At 9.02 a.m., the Ryder truck exploded in front of the north side of the building, creating a 30-foot wide and 8-foot deep crater on Northwest 5th Street next to the building, and the blast measured 3.0 on the Richter scale. The bombing killed 168 people. The victims ranged in age from 3 months to 73 years old, including three pregnant women with another 680 people injured and it destroyed more than one-third of the building, which had to be demolished. It also destroyed or damaged 324 other buildings within a 16-block radius. Glass was shattered and 258 buildings and 86 cars were destroyed. The damage caused an estimated $652 million worth of damage. McVeigh was arrested within 90 minutes near Perry in Noble County, Oklahoma, while driving the Yellow Marquee North on Interstate 35. Oklahoma State Trooper Charlie Hanger stopped McVeigh for driving the car without a license plate and arrested him for having a concealed weapon. While being booked, McVeigh falsely claimed that he resided at Terry Nichols' brother, James Nichols' home address in Michigan. After booking McVeigh, Trooper Hanger searched his patrol car and found a business card from a Wisconsin military surplus store, which McVeigh had apparently dropped. Written on the back of the card was, quote, TNT at $5 a stick, need more. That card was brought into evidence at McVeigh's trial. Ten days later, Terry Nichols was also arrested. Federal agents were able to link the VIN number on an axle of the truck to a specific Ryder rental agency in Junction City, Kansas. A sketch artist worked with Eldon Elliott, the owner of the agency. Lee McGowan of the Dreamland Motel also identified McVeigh as the man who parked a large yellow Ryder truck in the parking lot. McVeigh later acknowledged the casualty, saying, I didn't define the rules of engagement in this conflict. The rules, if not written down, are defined by the aggressor. It was brutal, no holds barred. Women and kids were killed at Waco and Ruby Ridge. You put back in the government's faces exactly what they're giving out. He later stated, I wanted the government to hurt like the people of Waco and Ruby Ridge had. McVeigh also stated, You learn how to handle killing in the military. I faced the consequences, but you learn to accept it. McVeigh ironically believed that the bomb attack had a positive impact on U.S. government policy, and he cited the peaceful resolution of the Montana Freeman standoff in 1996, the government's $3.1 million settlement with the Weaver family, and the April 2000 statements by President Bill Clinton regretting his decision to storm the Branch Davidian compound in Waco. McVeigh stated, once you bloody the bully's nose, and he knows he's going to be punched again, he's not coming back around. The official FBI investigation, classified as OK Bomb, involved 28,000 interviews, 3,200 kilograms of evidence, and nearly 1 billion pieces of forensic evidence. The evidence collected at McVeigh's home included the telephone number that led them to one of the farms where he bought the supplies for the bomb. McVeigh went on trial and was convicted in 1997. Timothy McVeigh was sentenced to death and executed by lethal injection on June 11, 2001 at the U.S. Federal Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. Terry Nichols was sentenced to life in prison in 2004. Michael and Lori Fortier testified against McVeigh and Nichols. 
Michael Fortier was sentenced to 12 years in prison for failing to warn the United States government, and his wife Lori, in a plea deal, received immunity from prosecution for testifying against all parties. On April 19, 2000, the Oklahoma City National Memorial was dedicated on the site of the Murrah Federal Building, commemorating the victims and remembrances and services are held every year on April 19th at the time of the explosion. Thank you for watching Forgotten History. Please click like, subscribe, and share. Send us comments and show ideas, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.